It is my pleasure to once again interview our sitting congressman, Bill Keating, from the 9th Congressional District. Uh, good to see you once again at our 2012 Jefferson Jackson dinner. It's great to be here, and I like the way you say the 9th, because that's, I hope you're right. It's, well, it's, it's <laughs> the 10th now, but it will be the 9th. That's right. Well, it's been a, an interesting change with redistricting yes. and with that whole, how has that gone for, for you and the staff? I think it's gone well. It's one more challenge between doing the work in Washington and here. The one thing I've noticed uh, personally is uh, it's much more difficult to campaign because mm. you're spending time in Washington and time here. So uh, that's a constraint I haven't uh, ever experienced before. But we're doing it, and, and, and it's working well. And you're doing an admirable job of it because we see you all over the Cape, Brewster and Bloom, yeah. uh, various points of Cape Cod, Plymouth, was, and the South Coast. This is my second stop in Hyannis this evening. So That's right. That's right. Well, uh, this, this past year has been particularly challenging in terms of the economy, in terms of jobs, job creation, the difficulties there. You've been helping us in Congress. Can you tell us a little bit about, about the efforts you've had? Well, we've been successful on, on a few fronts, despite the very difficult environment in Washington. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was important, I'm a member of the Small Business Committee, right. uh, one of the uh, things we had to do, playing defense, mm -hmm. uh, there was monies that, that were going out to uh, help small business innovation research mm -hmm. funds. Uh, the, Massachusetts is the second state in the country, our, our little state, in utilizing these. And it's been one of the things that's propelled the small businesses forward, the innovation businesses. And there was a movement in Congress to cap that. That, cap the amount that each state could have because two states uh, are up and ab above everyone else. Uh, it's California and then Massachusetts. Mm. And what we want to do is make sure that was done on merit, mm. uh, not on just arbitrary things like, well, we're going to just parcel it out among states. We were able to stop that and we were able to get an authorization for more of these funds until 2017. And we were also able to raise the cap of those funds. Mm. They have been for areas like Cape and Cape businesses, one of the lifebloods uh, to give them capital for these new startup businesses. So we're excited about that. That's happened. Uh, we also, uh, for small businesses that are going public, we did, did away with some of the regulatory issues that hampered their ability to do that, to get increased capital. So in the midst of uh, a pretty tough environment getting things done, from the small business perspective, we we're able to get a few things done important things uh, that will help our area. Important news, especially in this economy where we need jobs, we need opportunities, access to capital for small businesses. Yes. And thank you very much for clearing that up so that we can have some of those opportunities here. Oh, it's being utilized in the Cape. Uh, people wouldn't realize it right off the bat, but uh, if, what we're going to try and do is identify some of those so people become aware. Mm that this is something that uh, will help our state in particular. Uh, how has the gridlock down in the House affected the way that you're able to deliver things here in the Commonwealth and around the country where, it's, where else it's needed? Well, a lot of the grid gridlock isn't partisan gridlock. Mm -hmm. uh, what's happened after the last election is uh, there's been a new infusion of you know, uh, Tea Party type mm -hmm. uh, Republicans. And within the Republican caucus, uh, there's been difficulties in advancing issues. The Speaker has tried two or three times to advance issues and only to find out is he can't get the support of his caucus on some major issues uh, that affected uh, uh, all of us, uh, whether it was a government shutdown that was impending or default on the U.S. dollar. I was able to cross party lines and be able to join uh, a movement in the Senate to make sure those things didn't happen. Uh, but we should be able to try and get a consensus, I hope, uh, next year because this year's become problematic, let's face it. Uh, but I hope next year we're able to do it. But it's not as partisan. It's, it, what's really causing the initial uh, gridlock is that uh, internal strife that's going on right now within the within the majority party. I see. All right. And with regard to this being a presidential election year, does that maybe compound the issue in the atmosphere down there? I think when you had the uh, Senate Minority Leader, Mitch McConnell from Kentucky, say his primary goal was to defeat the president. Mm. The primary goal of all of us is to put people to work. Uh, our economy's front and center. If our economy moves forward, it deals with uh, significantly with the deficit. Just a, a drop of a few percentage points in unemployment will result in a 30% uh, cut in our deficit. So the two things are intertwined. Mm. Uh, so we can't have an issue where we're going to stop and try and put a roadblock to necessary jobs uh, for political reasons. Mm. Uh, and and to, I'm sorry to report that you know that is somewhat the case. I know you've also been very vocal with regard to your support of the president's health care bill. Um, how do you see that moving forward in this Congress? I try to tell people, uh, my colleagues around the country, uh, I said, come to Cape Cod. 
look at what's going on with the community health centers in Cape Cod, uh, in the lower Cape, uh, and how successful that's been in terms of providing access, which is really a rural area. People don't view it that way, but it is. Uh, in the central part of the Cape, how it's working well, uh, and the way the hospitals are working with these community health centers and the innovations that are there with the community health centers. We're seeing the future. People don't realize it's all around them, but we're seeing the future uh, here in Cape Cod. People have really made the effort in the health uh, industry uh, to be a success. Uh, and uh, I can't tell you how impressed I've been uh, with what's going on here. Uh, people realize that I think as they're part of the system, but uh, if we move in the direction that we have shown here uh, in access and in, in hospitals that are linked to the teaching hospitals, uh, the best care, uh, and have them work in unison, that's, what, that's what's going to help not only improve the quality, but it's going to uh, contain the cost better because if you have good preventative care and good primary care, that drives the cost down because people aren't getting sicker. The first portal of entry is not the emergency room. Uh, and when people don't have that kind of insurance, they're still getting care. So you can do the math. The math is someone is paying for that care. It's the rest of us. So it's also a fairer system for those of us that have insurance that previously had been paying not only our costs, but the costs of other people who aren't paying. Right. Speaking of costs, um, the Massachusetts Senate candidate, Elizabeth Warren, has talked a little bit about that, about uh, costs and the costs that are borne by large corporations uh, disproportionately against standard U.S. citizens and the tax rates that they pay, the fact that corporations like GE have managed to pay nothing in taxes, whereas the costs are only rising on the lower middle class. Is there anything that you see that can be done in Congress to start working in the direction to help those well, I think I, I think there's a very strong sentiment uh, among the majority of Americans to change the tax code, and that doesn't mean uh, you know raising it. If we do things correctly, for the average person, it could lower the tax rate uh, by dealing with some of the exemptions that are there. Some of them are uh, just have no meaning anymore. Why are we giving uh, you know over a 10-year period 43 billion dollars in tax breaks to? oil companies. Why are taxpayers paying that? that and 93 percent of that, well, 93 percent of that money goes into preferred stock buybacks for the executives and, and executive bonuses. That's been proven. So that's probably the, one of the most egregious examples, but that money uh, should either go to reducing uh, tax rates or dealing with the deficit. Uh, we're a country that has the ability uh, to do both, and, and actually every economic expert is saying, if we're going to attack the deficit, we have to do it by taking a, you know, a long-term framework and be disciplined about it, but at the same time, do things that are going to increase revenues with necessary jobs. I'll tell you about another, quickly, about another deficit. We have a $2.2 .2 trillion deficit right now uh, in uh, our infrastructure. Now, that's not going to heal itself. There's no holistic way for bridges and roads to deal with it. Themselves. <laughs> and, and, as, and, and by not acting on it, uh, we're just, you know, waiting till later on to have a more expensive, uh, you know, bill at the end of it. But we're hurting our economy because we have to have a distribution ne network that's clear. And that could be rail, that could be dredging for different parts of the country. We, we should be moving forward in that. And that's, that's another deficit we have. That's interesting because I think as, as individual homeowners, we all recognize the idea that if you put off a repair now, it only gets more expensive it down does. the road. It won't fix itself. But on a larger scale, these infrastructural improvements have to be addressed at some point or they're just going I to get I think we should get. take the politics out of that. Uh, there's no earmarking uh, right now, mm -hmm. and I don't think there's any in the foreseeable future. Uh, I'm a, a sponsor of uh, National Infrastructure Bank, mm -hmm. and that's something that will be continuous. You won't wait for uh, actions okay. after a certain number of years for Congress to suddenly act on it with all the special interests involved in it. It should be something that's continuous and available to the private sector to come in and get lower uh, percentage loans and, and loan guarantees as well. So uh, hopefully that's something that will take this problem so we're not having a reoccurring problem, so we're not uh, dealing efficiently with issues, and so we're not allowing the private sector to come in and, uh, and leverage some of that as well. What do you think you're looking forward to in this uh, this coming year? What do you think looks at particularly promising that you're really you got your radar well, zeroed? Let me on? tell you, uh, I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee, and it gives me the opportunity to talk to some of the business leaders in other countries. And here's a, a note of great uh, optimism that I feel: these countries, especially the European countries, 
they want to do additional investments in the U.S. They're, they're concerned about the economic situation in Europe. They can, they're really frustrated in dealing with the Chinese. They want to come to the U.S. They want to do additional investments. But the uncertainty of tax credits, how long they'll be there, if they'll be at all, the tax structure, those things should be resolved. We have to, and I, it's been one of my points of uh, great concern and great interest, we have to work on the business side to give predictability and certainty to issues. If we do that, this investment's going to come here. Uh, you know, no one's more critical in the U.S. than Americans. We forget, and it's given me a different perspective, how attractive we can be if we take that uncertainty out, not only for small businesses that are here, but for the uh, big corporations that want to invest in the U.S., producing jobs in the U.S. Uh, and I, I'm finding that as I talk to people. And the democratic rule of law, the regulatory framework that we have, typically had been an, an, an attractive area for foreign investment. But if we can... It still is, but it just can grow exponentially. Okay. Excellent. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comments. Thank, thank you for your hard work in representing thank us you. on the Cape. Thanks, Michael. No.